Mental health, it's such an important and often not talked about enough issue facing many Americans today. We're at Mile Bluff Medical Center where we're going to learn a little bit more about it, how we can help ourselves, and how your family physician can also help you. My panelists are going to include Dr. Brian Myers from Family Medicine, Martha Erth Kindry, Executive Director of the Mile Bluff Medical Center Foundation, and Melissa Fry, social worker here at Mile Bluff. From the Mile Bluff Medical Center here in Mauston, I'm Justin Riley, and this is Wisconsin doctors. Welcome back to Wisconsin Doctors. We're here at Mile Bluff Medical Center and today we're learning a little bit about mental health issues. We'll talk about some misconceptions and some ways that the folks here at Mile Bluff can help you out. And first, I want to talk with Dr. Brian Myers. How are you? Good. How are you today? Good. I understand that you are a new addition to the Mile Bluff Medical Center family and offer a full spectrum of family services. And one of the most common issues that people present to their primary care physician, and this is really fascinating, is actually mental health related. So what are some of the mental health issues that you're seeing uh, people bring to you? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, historically, uh, years ago, mental health wasn't something that was common uh, to be seen in a primary care office. And if you look back at residency training and medical training for family uh, practice physicians, there wasn't a lot of mental health training. Um, but as um, lots of the panel here can share, uh, the shortage of care with uh, mental health providers over the last several years has kind of by necessity brought that into primary care. And actually over the last 10 years we've seen a lot of additional training uh, for family medicine doctors to be able to provide that care. Um, and we actually find that about half of patients um, in their lifetime will experience some sort of mental health illness. And one of the best places to start with that care and even fully get that care is through primary care. After all, as your doctor, I know you best, hopefully, right? I mean, right. You've, you've met with me, we've been meeting for years, I know your family, your children, your parents, right. possibly, where you can put some of that into context. Um, the, some other statistics, like 30% of patients of my visits that I typically are, some, are mental health. So wow. the, ex the experience is there, we see it very commonly. Things we see, it's, it's the common things you see around the community. Um, it's the common things that you know people experience, um, whether that's situational, whether there's an acute stressor, whether that's a death in the family or sure. a change in job or finance or et cetera, um, right. that you know, we frequently deal with that. And sometimes it's just you know, seeing that patient and reassuring and, and, and telling them that this stuff right. is normal and helping with that. Right. Uh, some of the more chronic uh, mental illnesses, whether that's depression or sure. anxiety, um, or panic attacks, um, right. ADHD, um, difficulty with concentrating, um, or you know, in geriatric populations where we can see uh, depression as well as dementia and other things. People usually will experience some sort of mental health issue sometime throughout their life, and I think that's a pretty reasonable expectation because most people experience some sort of physical ailment, so why wouldn't they experience some sort of mental health issue? And you are there to kind of help them, if it is situational, say, hey, you know, this is okay, this is normal, this happens. So I have a question about uh, mental health and chronic illness. Is there any connection between those two? I would say they connect both ways. Okay. Um, so when we diagnose somebody with diabetes, we do that very frequently. Diabetes is very, very common. Um, that me telling a patient, you know, oh, you have a new diagnosis of diabetes, it seems kind of straightforward. It's something we do every day. Right. But for that patient, um, that shock, that change, that, that change in expectations, the lifestyle changes, medications, and possible side effects, that stress alone can bring on mental health issues, whether that's underlying with a history of chronic depression or anxiety, or something that's been more mild and the new stressor brings it on. But just as important um, as a primary care doctor is the understanding that people with that underlying depression, it actually makes their diabetes worse. It makes their diabetes worse. It yeah. makes their outcomes for cancer treatments worse. Um, why? Can't necessarily say 100% for sure, but there's definitely a, a, a mind control of our health. And when mm -hmm. you feel you're going to get better, lots of people get yep. better. That's true. Yeah. Yep. Um, but there's probably also a portion of you know, treatment of diabetes and heart disease and cancer and all sorts of things it takes a lot. Right. And 
with uncontrolled depression, it's hard to get motivated to take that right. medicine, follow the lifestyle changes, yeah. um, and do the things that are necessary. You get into that cycle pretty quick. We have just under a minute left, so really quickly, can you talk about some ways that the primary care doctor uh, treats, how, how they treat mental illness? I think one of the best things a primary care doctor can do is relate to that patient and discuss what their goals are and their history and put things into context for them. Help patients realize that it's common and normal uh, to be dealing with a lot of this and then look at treatment. Um, in lots of cases that, that can be medications, but really working with a therapist is probably just as good if not better than medications. In some cases in talking with patients, we, we kind of judge how much does it affect them, right. how much is it affecting their life, and we use right. that to determine you know, what steps we need to do to treat that. Absolutely. We've got to take a short break. When we come back here at Mile Bluff Medical Center, we're going to talk about ways that you can find some balance in your life. Stick around. We'll be right back with more Wisconsin Doctors. Welcome back to Wisconsin Doctors. We are here at Mile Bluff Medical Center and we're talking mental health today. And earlier we learned a little bit about how the primary care physician is really kind of the starting point and often the person who is treating some of these mental illnesses nowadays. Right now we're going to talk a little bit about how we can kind of maybe not treat ourselves but how we can kind of find a little bit more balance in our lives. So I want to just ask our panel, when it comes to our own mental health, why is it so important to learn how to balance our lives? Well, it's really important to balance your life mm -hmm. because between work, taking care of kids, if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to help take care of anybody else. Right. It's kind of one of those things like uh, you see in the airplanes, you help your, you do your own oxygen mask <laughs> first before you put the one on your kids. So exactly. You want to make sure that you're squared away first, yeah. so otherwise to, you can't help. I like right. to use the analogy that uh, life is stressful. Right. And so it's not necessarily a new stress, sometimes it's just the stress that builds up and I tell patients, imagine if I told you to hold a gallon of milk, right? Everyone can do that. Now if I told you to hold it for an hour and I'm going to come back. Yeah. So you got to have that outlet, you got to have a balance to let that stress out. So Interesting analogy, I like that analogy. So let's talk about some tips. How, how can we, what can we do to balance our lives a little bit more? I think the first thing we all need to start with is learning to say no. Um, Interesting. We like to say yes and we like to help everybody and we want to do everything, but really no one can do everything. It's You need to learn to say no to the things you don't have time for and the things you don't want to do. Right. Um, so that you have space in your life for everything that's important to you. So you're not so busy doing things you don't want to right. do and not have time to do that you can take care of yourself. There's such an expectation in our culture that everybody needs to just bite off more than they can chew. If you're not doing yes. that, then you're lazy. Right. But I think that's not the case. We want to make sure that we're telling people that, no, you, you do need to find balance in your life. You do need to have downtime. Very important. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about some more specifics about staying in the moment and what that means. Because there's so many people who just are, as they driving down the highway, myself included, when I was coming here, I'm thinking about all the things that I have to do when I get back to the office today. So what are some things that we can do to stay in the moment and why is that so important? Oh, I don't know, just when you said that, it just made me immediately think of something that I read, and that is everybody thinks anywhere between 50,000 and 70,000 thoughts a day that go through your mind. Wow. So staying in the moment is often very difficult, especially if you are feeling pressured, you're feeling stressed, sure. you're in a hurry, all those things. Yeah. So being in the moment actually brings you back to that time. Um, there was a fellow, he's an older rancher anyway, uh, younger kid was like, well, what's the most important time in your whole life? Mm -hmm. You know, you're 70-some years old, what's the most important time? He said, right now, this moment. Yep. And that's, that's kind of, in essence, what it is, is being in that moment. That's when you can do something. You can do something about this moment. You can make wise choices in this moment and make that moment a good choice for health and happiness. And, just a positive experience. And just choosing to be there and choosing to be just right here where yeah. we're at and out and you know, being engaged. You know, it's so important. Step one, turn off your cell phone. There you go. <laughs> yeah. yes. you know, I mean how many times do you see people that are in a great experience or having a conversation and you sit there you're having dinner and both people are staring at their cell phones. So right. Step one, turn off your phone. Right. They gotta take pictures of their food though. Yeah, so. Exactly. Yeah. How else are people on Facebook gonna know what I'm eating? You know? So uh, I've heard some people talk about journaling. 
You know, there are folks out there who like to um, just write at the end of the day. What kinds of journaling do you suggest and when should you do it? And really, why is it so important to do this? Anybody? No, journaling, to understand, because I, I journal, and I know a lot of people journal specific to what happened to them during the day. Sure. You know, and some people do it through, okay, and this morning I got up at this time and I did this, and they kind of chronicle their day. Some people journal things that are, this is what I'm grateful for today. Mm -hmm. These are the things that somebody did for me today or that I was able to do. So there's really all sorts of ways you can journal. It's uh, more of an introspection and you are kind of communicating with yourself about what right. has happened to you and even maybe assessing some of those things. I imagine it sort of helps solidify the thoughts or feelings or events of the day so that you can kind of yeah. understand them a little bit better. Or it even could validate your feelings because I think a lot of times with stress or with depression or anxiety or any mental illnesses sometimes people are really seeking validation for right. what they're feeling. Yeah absolutely. We got to take a short break. We come back we're going to focus a little bit on social work right here at Mile Bluff Medical Center. We'll be right back with more Wisconsin Doctors. Welcome back to Wisconsin Doctors. We're here at Mile Bluff Medical Center. We're learning a lot about mental health and the importance of taking care of yourself and how these folks at Mile Bluff can help as well. And now we're going to kind of delve into the area of social work. So we're going to talk to our resident social worker here, Melissa. How are you? I'm great. So let's talk about social work. What areas specifically are you covering? Here at Mile Bluff, I, my main area is in the dialysis unit, okay. but I also cover people in acute care, in the nursing homes, I assist with diabetic education, kind of anywhere where a person needs help. Okay, so, great. great. With so emotional you, needs. So you're kind of bouncing around from a couple of different departments, that's Absolutely. great. Absolutely. And one of the things that we talked about a little bit between some of these segments is you said there's a, a difference, and I think people have a basic understanding of this, that there's a, a difference between emotional and logical thinking. Can you give us some examples and talk about the differences? Yes, so um, your brain can only emotionally think or logically think. Um, they can't do both at the same time. So if you're really angry, that's not the time to sit down and have a logical conversation. Right. Um, so what we need to do is when people are in their logical thinking, mm -hmm. we need to give them some time so exactly. emotional thinking. Emotional, emotional thinking. thinking. Yeah, I gotcha, yeah. I gotcha. We know um, what you meant. <laughs> with emotional thinking, you right. need to let them have some time to move from that emotional thinking because right. you can't just flip a switch and move right. to logical thinking. Right. Um, so it's important for ourselves and for other people we're working with um, to give them time to move from the emotional sure. thinking. Okay. So moving from the emotional thinking and to the logical typically takes time. Yes. Should we set a stopwatch or anything like that? No. Or is it allowed to take time? allow it to take time. <laughs> some people can do it really quickly. Some people it takes a couple hours. Some people can do it in a few minutes. Sure. So you really yeah. just need to let the person make that determination when they're ready to have a logical conversation. I found that so true because, you know, sometimes I'll... I'll uh, I'll, you know, my wife and I, we bicker every now and then, so, uh, and I'll feel angry and I'll try to talk to her in this really logical way, but I find that I can't even get the words out because I'm just not thinking clearly. And it's only after I've kind of walked away from the situation for an hour maybe, and then I come back and now I can get my thoughts out. So, right. very right. important. So, um, let's talk about some things that we can do to maybe help us get a little bit closer to the logical thinking. Like, uh, I think you mentioned something about progressive relaxation. Yeah. So, progressive relaxation is where you tense a certain muscle group in your body and okay. then let it relax. So, I'll use the example of my shoulders because that's easy to see. Um, so, you would tense your shoulders up real tight for okay. like five seconds okay. and then let it go. <sighs> And just doing it once, you <laughs> yeah, feel better. That does feel better. Um, but do it a few times for the best sure. benefit. And you can actually use, kind of start from your feet mm -hmm. and each muscle group work all the way up to your head. Oh, okay. um, and if you do your whole body, you'll feel pretty relaxed after that. Just one muscle group at a time. Yep, one muscle group at a time. Does it help to kind of breathe through that? Kind of take yes. deep breaths as you're yep. tensing up and then... Absolutely. And the best way to do deep breaths, I mean, we all just think deep breath, okay. That's right. not the best way to right. do a deep breath. The best way to do a deep breath is you breathe in for the count of four. Okay. 
you hold it for the count of seven, and then you breathe out so that you can hear it for the count of eight. So it'd be like yeah, that type okay. of breathing out. Sure. That allows your body to um, circulate the oxygen, which will also help calm you. Sure. So let's talk about exercise and the important role that exercise plays in mental health. Exercise is huge. Um, with mental health. The more you can get out and get moving, and it doesn't have to be going and running a marathon. It right. can be, if all you can do is go outside and walk for five minutes sure. at a slow pace, that yeah. will have a huge benefit with sure. stress reduction and mental health. Any kind of exercise is good. So we've got about uh, 50 seconds here. Can you tell us how we can be happy? So, <laughs> so the ways to be happy, there's actually three keys. Um, they've done research and they found if you are um, three gratitudes in a day. Three gratitudes, okay. Um, meditate for two minutes and praise someone every day. Praise somebody. Okay. Praise somebody every day. It's all things that are kind of outside of yourself and so that you're sure. grateful for what you have, which then leads to happiness. Yeah, it's so easy for people to get kind of caught up in their own minds. So I think that's a great idea just to kind of live outside yourself. Yes. That way, the way yes. of speaking. So, well, thank you very much, Melissa. We got to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to wrap this all up, this conversation about mental health here at Mile Bluff Medical Center. So stick around. back to Wisconsin Doctors. We're here at Mile Bluff Medical Center talking about mental health and ways that we can sort of pay attention to our own mental health. And we're going to talk a little bit to Martha Erth Kindry. How are you, Martha? Good, Justin. Your role here is Executive Director of the Mile Bluff Medical Center Foundation. So first of all, can you tell us a little bit more about the foundation? Oh, sure. Mile Bluff Medical Center Foundation uh, exists solely to support the medical center itself, the nursing homes, and the outreach clinics. So the foundation is kind of a, a backup for the medical center to help them along with any of the needs that we have, things that we can do, especially for the the community or for the medical center itself. Um, our mission and goals are the same as the medical center is to care for the health and wellness of our community. And there are some ways that you do that, that the uh, foundation does that very well. Can you talk about some of the things that they do to help uh, people manage their mental health and balance their lives? Sure. Well, actually, it's, it's good timing because we actually have uh, our Women's Day Out is coming up. It's okay. October 5th, and so we have a couple of weeks to go. This is our 10th year. And Women's Night Out is, as you might suppose, for women sure. um, to come to. And when we're looking at health and wellness, you're looking at all aspects of health and wellness. Right. So you have mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, you have all those things that mm -hmm. come together into a well-being right. right. that people have. So um, the Women's Night Out is specifically made to help women to see what kind of resources we have in this area and then to bring in as kind of the highlight of the evening to have a keynote speaker who okay. is someone that will let you take home a message that you can remember that will help you with your just being enthusiastic, help you handle stress, help you balance life, things like that that bring true meaning to the evening. That's awesome that you're bringing in these keynote speakers, these sort of yeah. experts to kind of share their experience. So yeah. who are some of the uh, keynote speakers time. you have during the event and, and, and talk to us a little yeah. bit about what the attendees can expect. Well, <laughs> uh, actually it's going to be very nice this year because we have two speakers that are very complimentary. Um, one of them is Susie Favor Hamilton okay. and the other is Amy D. Um, Susie Favor Hamilton is a very actually well known in Wisconsin. Uh, she was a she ran for UW for years and was a champion mm -hmm. in just in the state itself, like a multiple championships. As, as a runner? As a runner, okay. yep, as a long distance runner. Okay. And then um, she actually was a three-time Olympian wow. as well. And um, at one point she was the fastest woman in the world for a long distance really? running. So she had quite the, quite the athletic career and um, you can imagine the stresses and everything of always being on top of the right. game. And she was very, um, very high energy, very into her sport, very mm -hmm. competitive, all sure. those things. Mm -hmm. And then she faced some difficulties in her life 
and in her family, her brother was bipolar and actually committed suicide. And uh, this was right before her last Olympic race that that occurred. But she had these enormous life-changing experiences where she did, she lost control of herself and was just stuck in a spiral that uh, she didn't know what to do and they had diagnosed her with depression and anyway, I'll, I won't finish the whole story, but the long and right. the short of it is that she um, came out in public and told people what had happened to her so that people could learn that you need to communicate, you can't bury things and hide things, it just makes things worse. Right. You need to bring it out, you need to acknowledge it. And she talks a lot about shame and not um, not being ashamed, so you wouldn't say, I'm bipolar, you would right. say, I have bipolar disorder. Yeah. You know, so right. taking yourself away from Right, yeah, I'm not saying that you are that thing. Right. So right. Uh, we just have a few, we just have just under a minute left, but if for someone who might be dealing with uh, mental health issues, um, uh, like some of your inspirational speakers, what are some stigmas that they may face? Oh, um, there's a lot of stigmas out there. Uh, one of them I just mentioned is the, the idea of shame. Another one would be that um, you're afraid, somebody may be afraid of someone with mental illness mm. because they might hurt you, they might, right. you just don't know, you feel unsure and a little bit afraid of people. Um, sure. And then you have bullying, taking advantage of a person that's already sure. having trouble. Sure, and some things that people can do to maybe overcome those. Yeah, I think that one of the biggest things I, I did mention was communicating. Talk yep. to talk to someone, talk to your provider, talk, talk to, to a friend, talk to yeah. your family, um, get help. Yep. Talk positively about the your disorder right. and how you're getting away from it. Yep. And then we have support groups that people can go to and talk to others that are fighting the same challenges. Yep. Talk. Mm -hmm. Talk. <laughs> there you go. Well, Martha Eric Kendry, thank you so much. I actually want to thank all of my panelists. We're out of time today. I can't believe it yeah. already. I want to thank our viewers as well. We're Wisconsin doctors. And from all of us here at Mobloff Medical Center, we're inviting you to live longer, live better. We'll see you next time. <laughs>